before I start, just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. If you look at the um, taskbar, you'll notice a little um, symbol that says chat. Only use the chat button if you're having some kind of a technical difficulty, if you can't hear the recording or can't see the images. If you want to ask a question during the, the presentation, if you look along that taskbar, you'll see um, a symbol that says more with a couple of dots. Click on there and you will actually see a Q&A box. So if you want to type your question into the Q&A box and then we will answer the questions at the end of the presentation. So we will start. So as I said, today we're talking about laser hair removal. And our agenda will start off looking at the anatomy of hair. Then we'll go through some of the principles of laser hair removal. Briefly, the pre and post treatment guidelines, then looking at choosing the correct device. And then I wanted to talk a little bit towards the end of the presentation about paradoxical hair growth. And then I'll summarize the presentation. So if we first of all look at the anatomy, there are two important structures when it comes to looking at removing hair with a laser. The first one is the bulb, which sits at the bottom, as you can see, of the hair follicle. And this is where the blood supply enters into the follicle. <clears throat> so if we're going to have effective reduction in the hair, the first thing we need to do is disrupt that blood supply. The second important structure is in the bulge, which is located close to the erectile pili muscle. And this is where the stem cells are produced. So what we want to do during the treatment is firstly, as I mentioned, destroy that blood supply, but secondly, to destroy the stem cells that sit in the bulge so the body isn't able to produce a new hair within that hair follicle. There are various cycles in, in the growth of hair. <clears throat> we have an anagen stage, a catagen stage, and a telogen stage. The stage that we really are focusing on when we're doing our hair reduction or hair removal is the anagen phase. And as you can see from the diagram here, this is where we have the full structure of the hair. So the hair has a, an intact blood supply and it's sitting very close and actually touching the sides of the follicle itself. So you have a complete structure. As we move to the catagen stage, you can see we don't now have a connected blood supply. The hair is thinning and it's no longer in complete contact with the walls of the follicle. And then moving into the telogen stage, this is when the hair is just getting to the stage of falling out or shedding. And again, we don't have a complete structure by this stage. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is looking at the, um, the process. So you can see we go from the growing phase, the antigen phase, into the regression, the resting phase, and then the shedding phase. And then we start the process again. So we get a new hair forming within the follicle. And then when we get to the late stage of anagen, we have that complete structure again, and the whole cycle begins once again. There are a number of different things that will affect hair growth within an individual. Hormones can increase hair growth. So during pregnancy, or if you have a patient or a client with polycystic ovaries disease, this will stimulate increased hair growth. Various endocrine dysfunctions can also do this, things like thyroid disorders. The area on the body that the hair is growing will vary. And also an important factor here is the actual color of the hair. So hair has melanin in it. Then this melanin can either be eumelanin or pheomelanin. The melanin we're really interested in when we're doing these procedures is the eumelanin, because this is the, the brown, dark brown, black color 
as opposed to the fear melanin, which is the much pinkier, lighter color. Hair growth cycle will vary depending on the part of body that we're treating. And also there will be a difference in the depth that the follicles are within the tissue, depending again on the area of the body that we're actually focusing on. So the FDA definition is the long-term stable reduction in the number of hairs regrowing after a treatment regime. And it's important to remember at this point that we're talking about permanent hair reduction and not permanent hair removal. Partly because, as I showed in the previous slide, there are various factors that can actually stimulate new hair to grow, particularly hormones, certain diseases, etc., can stimulate the hair. So it's permanent hair reduction and not permanent hair removal. And how does it work? We're targeting that pigment within the hair follicle. So we're looking at the eumelanin rather than the pheomelanin. And the energy from the laser or the light source will actually be absorbed into the melanin within that hair, which heats it up. And that heat then diffuses into the shaft. And we then heat up both the bulb and the bulge, disrupting the blood supply and destroying the stem cells that are sitting in that bulge area. Studies have shown that we get over 80% reduction in the amount of regrowth of hair after a series of treatments. Typically, we're looking at three, possibly four treatments by which stage we're having 80% reduction. And then if we carry on and do further treatment, we will get even more reduction in the hair. However, because we're targeting the melanin, and that's our main chromophore or color, we're unable to treat white, gray, blonde, or very pale red hair because we don't have enough of our targeted melanin, the chromophore we're looking for in these hair types. Again, really important, Hair removal remains the number one requested energy-based aesthetic treatment within the aesthetic industry. In, it depends on the makeup of the, of the clinic, but in general, at least a generally 80% of energy-based treatments tend to be laser hair reduction. So it's a very big market. And just as importantly, if we look at the global revenue. You can see in 2019, the global revenue was somewhere in the region of $550 million. And depending on the study or the market research you look at, the projected global revenue by 2027 could be 1.37 billion. Some of the studies are actually showing an even higher number at this stage, but I've given you a conservative estimate, but it still shows that we are all, we're looking from 2019 to 2027, almost a threefold increase in the revenue. Let's look at some of the principles of laser hair removal. Our main goal is to destroy whatever our primary target is, and today we're obviously focusing on hair, so it's pigment, by heating that, that hair to a high enough temperature that we destroy it without damaging the surrounding tissues, which again is a very important point. The fact that, yes, we want to destroy our target, but we want to preserve the tissue around that target. And we do this by something that's called selective photothermolysis. And this was a concept that was originally proposed by Rox Anderson back in 1983. And those of you familiar with lasers and research, you'll be very aware of his name. Rox Anderson is, is a professor based in the States, and he's had an involvement basically in 
developing virtually every wavelength of laser that we're using in aesthetic or medicine today. And he states that if you <clears throat> select a specific wavelength, you can then destroy a target containing an adequate chromophore or the color that we're looking for without damaging that surrounding tissue. And the reason this is possible is because we're looking at what we call the thermal relaxation time of that target. And we want that thermal relaxation time to be longer than the duration of the pulse from the laser. And the definition of the thermal relaxation time, or the TRT, is the time it takes for that target tissue to cool down by 50%. And this is through the heat being transferred into the surrounding tissue via thermal diffusion. So we want to make sure, whatever our target might be, that the thermal relaxation time is longer than the length of time we're firing the laser onto that target, into that target. Various different studies, and they come up with different numbers, but the estimate of the TRT or thermal relaxation time of hair is between 10 and 50 milliseconds. The reason that we have a difference in the time of that TRT is all based on the thickness of the hair. So the finer the hair, the shorter the thermal relaxation time because the volume of hair that you're heating up is smaller with thin hair than it is if you're treating thicker hair. So an effective hair reducing system must have the ability to deliver short pulses. The parameters we're using are obviously we're looking at the wavelength, then the pulse duration, the fluence or the energy that we're delivering and also the spot size. So how quickly we can cover a specific area or if we're looking at treating very small areas, having the ability to reduce that spot size that we're not covering too big an area with each pulse. As I'm sure you're all aware, the wavelength is determined by our lasing medium. And we measure this in nanometers or micrometers. And the longer the wavelength, the deeper it will penetrate into the tissue until we get to around about 1200 nanometers. Because once we reach that 1200 nanometer point, the chromophore starts to become water. And obviously the tissue, the cells within the tissue have a very, very high percentage of water in them. So we start to get absorption into that water in the cells before any other structures. But as we move from 532 nanometers, for instance, to 755, and again up to 1064, we, we're penetrating deeper into the tissue. <clears throat> so if we look at the absorption spectrum, specifically here, we're looking at the melanin, so we're looking at hair removal. You can see the Ruby laser at 694 has the best absorption into melanin. However, the issue with, with ruby lasers, which were one of the first hair removal lasers that were on the market, because that absorption is so good into the melanin, you have to be very careful treating darker skins. So you certainly can treat effectively skin types one and two on the Fitzpatrick scale, and possibly skin types three, but you certainly can't treat a four, a five, or a six. But if you move to an Alexandrite at 755, we're not getting quite such a good absorption into the melanin, but we're going deeper into the tissue, which is ensuring that we actually get into that bulb area where we have the blood supply feeding into that hair. Diodes at 810, you can see the absorption again is not as good, but they will go slightly deeper into the tissue, but they're not absorbing as well into the melanin as an Alexandrite does at 755. And here you can see graphically the difference in the length of the, the wavelength 
compared to the depth of penetration of the laser. <clears throat> so the ruby and the alexandrite are going deep enough to get to the base of the hair. The diode's going slightly deeper, and then the 1064 NDAG is going deeper again. So all of these three wavelengths we know are penetrating deep enough into the tissue to actually affect the full structure of the hair and the hair fiber. <clears throat> the pulse duration, again, very important. And this is obviously the length of time that we're delivering that energy from the laser into our tissue, which is sometimes referred to as time on tissue. This is expressed in milliseconds, particularly when we're talking about hair removal. However, if we're looking at treating other conditions, we could be using a nanosecond or even a picosecond. And as these pulses become shorter, we get less of a thermal effect and we get more of an acoustic effect. So when we move from a millisecond, which is one thousandth of a pulse, up to a picosecond, which is one trillionth of a pulse. In the picosecond, we're getting substantially more acoustic effect and significantly less heat being delivered. And this pulse duration is also key to actually confining that energy and that heat to the target we're aiming at, rather than being in a position where we're just heating up the surrounding tissue and we don't get our target to the optimum temperature that we actually can destroy it. And as I mentioned earlier, long pulses we use to heat larger volumes. So for today's presentation, specifically thicker hairs. And if the hair is thinner, we will use a shorter pulse <clears throat> because the volume of, of hair that we're actually treating is smaller. And we can think about this in a number of different ways. I think one of the easiest ways is to think about if you have a small espresso pot that you put on top of your stove, it only contains about 100, 150 mils of water. So it boils very, very quickly. But once you make your coffee, the coffee will actually cool down very quickly because it's such a small volume that the heating and the cooling happens rapidly. Whereas if you take a large kettle with maybe one and a half, two liters of water in it, this takes a lot longer to get to boiling point. And then if you make a large mug of coffee, the coffee will stay warm for a long time because of the fact that it's a much bigger volume with the heat in it and it takes longer for that to cool down. So one important point to consider is remember that the thermal relaxation time of that hair follicle will vary. So being able to deliver shorter pulses for finer hairs is critical in achieving good clearance of that hair for your clients and your patients. The fluence, this is the energy that we're delivering and we measure this in joules per centimeter squared. And to work out the fluence, we divide the energy by the area that we're treating. And we measure this in, as I said, the four centimeters squared. And it seems fairly obvious, but as we increase that fluence, we start to increase the destructive force of the laser. So if we, if we use the laser at its maximum energy, yes, we're going to destroy whatever our target might be, but the concern there is that we may then start damaging some of the surrounding tissue. So we have to get that combination between the pulse duration and the fluence correct in order to get efficient reduction in that hair, but also just as importantly, doing it as safely as possible. And there is also a relationship between the fluence and the spot size that we use. As we deliver that energy, the, the, the light energy, the photons into the tissue, that energy will start to dissipate once it, it gets into the tissue. 
And if we're using very small spot sizes, we start to, to reduce that energy more quickly and therefore we don't have sufficient energy within that pulse to go deeper into the tissue. But as we increase the size of that spot, it means that because we have a much larger volume of energy and light penetrating into the tissue, we're actually able to go deeper into whatever the structure is that we're treating. And this means that when we're doing hair removal, we need to be using fairly large spot sizes in order to get to the optimum depth so that we treat the whole of the structure right down into the bulb. So pre-treatment, it's important before you do the treatment that you make sure that your patient or your client has shaved their hair. We don't want three, four, five millimeters of hair sitting on the surface of the skin. The problem is if we have hair sitting on the surface of the skin, that will be the first point of absorption of the light and therefore the heat. And we can make the surface of the epidermis very hot. And the worst scenario is that we actually start burning the epidermis. Skin needs to be clean free of all lotions, perfumes, makeup, et cetera. And very importantly, no self tan. So no um, added pigment within the skin. If cleaning the skin with alcohol, it's really important to make sure that the area is completely dry. So the alcohol has either been wiped off or has evaporated before you start firing the laser on the spot. And another note with tattoos, never use a laser um, hair removal system for tattoo removal. There's far too much heat being delivered with these systems. And the issue with a tattoo is if you fire a laser producing a lot of heat onto a tattoo, yes, it will disrupt the ink and you will start to fade the tattoo, but there's so much heat going into that area the risk is that you will either blister or burn your client. <clears throat> so generally we suggest marking one or two centimeter ring around the, the tattoo before you start the treatment. And this also goes for treating an area where somebody may have permanent makeup. Within the history also, if you're treating the face, and your patient or your client has a history of recurrent cold sores or herpes simplex, then I would suggest using um, an antiviral starting the day before the treatment and lasting for about four or five days. If your client says the last time they had a cold sore was five years ago, just explain to them there is a very small risk that they could see um, an outbreak of that herpes, but you don't then need to use the antivirals. It's only if somebody's having regular outbreaks that you would need to use antivirals. When you're treating darker skin, particularly skin type 5 and definitely skin type 6, if you have a concern that that individual has a propensity for post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, then consider using some kind of prophylactic bleaching cream prior to the treatment. Next, very importantly, before, so six weeks before they start treatment and the whole way through their course of treatment, your patients should not be plucking, tweezing, waxing, threading, et cetera, or having any electrolysis. Because obviously all of these methods are physically removing that follicle or that hair, and therefore when you come to do the treatment, you have no target, so the treatment would be ineffective. The only time this would change is particularly if you're treating a face and the individual has some gray hairs, because as we know, the treatment is not effective on gray hair, they can pluck gray hairs. <clears throat> and always suggest they shave 24 or 48 hours prior to the treatment, I normally suggest that you ask your 
your patient or your client to shave the night before they come into the clinic for the treatments. And then you can ensure that the hair is short enough to be safe and effective in the treatment. Post-treatment instructions. Depending on the system you're using and the kind of cooling you're using, you may want to cool the skin afterwards because obviously we're using heat to destroy that hair. You can then apply some aloe vera or something similar. Generally, unless you see a very, very strong reaction, we don't recommend immediately using any hydrocortisone cream, but very importantly, always ensure that you're using a sunblock of a minimum of factor 30. The redness will last depending on where you're treating and the energy is anywhere from two to five hours. And in extreme cases, they may still see a little bit of erythema 24 or even 48 hours post-treatment. There will be a little bit of edema. And in some cases, they may find the area is a little bit sensitive or they may find a little bit of an itching sensation. If that itching sensation or that erythema is still present after 48 hours, it's at that stage I would consider using a topical hydrocortisone. And certainly within the UK, 1% hydrocortisone is available over the counter. And depending on the area we're treating will depend on the percentage of hair that is actually reduced with each one of the treatments. <clears throat> so the important question is, how do you choose the correct device for your hair removal? Commonly used wavelengths, we have an Alexandra at 755 nanometers, the diode at 810, an ND at 1064 nanometers, and you can also use um, intense pulse light systems. So looking at the factors that can influence the effect of the treatment itself. The color of the skin is very important, and here you have to think about choosing an appropriate wavelength. Firstly, that is effective at actually removing that hair, but secondly, making sure that the wavelength you're using is safe for the skin type you're actually treating. Depth of the follicle is another thing you need to think about. So as mentioned before about this relationship between the spot size and the depth of penetration into tissue, you need to, achieve, you need to choose the correct spot size or the appropriate spot size for the depth of the hair that you're treating. The color of the hair and the diameter of the hair here, again, we're looking at the wavelength and also very importantly, the pulse duration. Location on the body. Here, we're particularly looking at the percentage of antigen hair that there is in a specific area. And obviously the higher the percentage of antigen hair, firstly, the more hair that you will actually destroy in each treatment, but also the speed that that hair will regrow is higher when you have a higher percentage of antigen hair to when you have a lower percentage. And using the optimum fluences and also the optimum pulse duration. And finally, depending on the system you're using, if needed, make sure that you have an effective way of cooling the epidermis, which makes the treatment safer and reduces the side effects. I'm not going to go through this whole chart with you, but this is just showing you the percentage of antigen hair in different parts of the body. So you can see on the scalp, we have up to 85% antigen hair at any one time. And then we move down and you can see the axilla, the underarms, it's around about 30%. And the same um, with the bikini line, it's at 30%. <clears throat> so the ideal system needs to have the ability to adjust the pulse duration, because as I've already mentioned, 
if we're treating thick hair, we need longer pulses. And if we're treating thinner hair, we need shorter pulses. In addition to that, as we move through the first, the second, the third, and so on treatments, that hair will start to become thinner. So a very thick, coarse hair after the first treatment, when you get to maybe treatment four, is significantly thinner. And at which stage you need to have the ability to reduce your pulse duration so that you're still able to keep enough heat in that target to destroy the surrounding tissues rather than that heat being delivered over such a long period of time that you never get to the critical temperature and that heat just diffuses into the surrounding tissues. You need to have suitable wavelengths and ideally you need to be in a position that you have a system that allows you to treat all skin types. So rather than being a in a position where, for example, you can treat skin type one, two, and three, but your system isn't able to treat skin type four, fives, and sixes, this means that potentially you have to turn away a large number of potential clients because your system isn't able to treat their skin type safely. Different spot sizes, again, <coughs> two reasons. First of all, if you're treating a small area, for instance, the top lip, then you don't want to use the largest spot size available. You, you want a spot size that fits the area you're treating. And secondly, obviously the larger the spot size, the quicker the treatment will be. The bigger the area you cover with each pulse, so therefore you cover the whole area you're treating much more quickly using bigger spot sizes. And also, another important point is to have an effective correlation between that pulse duration and the fluence. Depending on the system, you may find that as you start reducing your pulse duration because the, the hairs are becoming thinner and thinner, the fluence that you're able to deliver is also reducing. And in some cases, that fluence can reduce so much that you're not actually getting an effective treatment with your very short pulses. There are two different treatment techniques that you tend to see when we're talking about laser hair removal. You can use multiple passes with a low fluence. And this generally is something that you will see with diode lasers in particular, rather than IPLs or Alexandrite or NDX. And the theory is that you're gradually heating up that follicle and the heat increases with each one of those subsequent passes you do over the area that you're treating. True, it's more comfortable because you're not using one pulse of high energy. You're doing a multiple, multiple passes with low energies and gradually building up the heat. It's more effective on thicker hair, certainly during the first maybe two or three treatments, but it's much less effective when that hair becomes thinner. So as you're going through that course of treatments and the hair is becoming thinner and thinner, you tend to find that the multiple pass technique is not as effective. And in many cases, what the clinics will then do is they will then have to switch to the other option where we're firing higher energy single pulses. The pulse duration is generally fixed, depending on the skin type that you're treating with these systems, which means that you don't have that ability to shorten your pulses as that hair becomes thinner. And finally, because you're doing multiple passes over one area, the treatment time is longer than the single pulse option. So here we have the single pulse high affluence. One pass, you don't double pass, you don't fire two pulses in the same area, so it means the treatment time is quicker. You have that ability to adjust the pulse duration based on the thickness of the hair you're treating, and it means, very importantly, that it's, it's effective on both thick and thin hair. And you can adjust the um, spot size determined on where you're treating and how quickly 
you're wanting to carry out the treatment. So the commonly used wavelengths I mentioned just now. First of all, let's look at the 810 nanometer diode. <laughs> so you saw from the absorption chart that we get very nice, very good absorption into melanin with this wavelength. It's effective on thicker hair, but it's less effective on the thinner hair, especially when you're using that multiple low fluids pass that I mentioned just now. And in general, you find with diode lasers, as you reduce that pulse duration, so you make the pulse duration shorter, you will also find that the system is not able to deliver the same level of fluence. And the potential here is that that fluence then falls below the effective fluence that you need to actually put enough heat into that hair to destroy it. And as I mentioned earlier, that multiple pass technique is not effective on the thin hair. You will find that a diode is able to treat all skin types. However, when you start to move, particularly into skin type six, you'll find that the pulses the diode laser are delivering can be as much as 400 milliseconds. And you remember at the start of the, the presentation, we were discussing the thermal relaxation of a hair follicle. And generally, it's regarded that the TRT of hair is somewhere between 10 and 50, possibly 60 milliseconds. So 400 milliseconds is way beyond the thermal relaxation time of the hair. So you're not going to get such an efficient clearance of that hair. Next, let's look at intense false light. We have again a good absorption into the melanin. And this really is determined by the wavelengths that are actually included within that range determined by that individual handpiece. There is an ability to alter pulse durations with intense pulse light. And it's effective on all hair thicknesses, maybe not so effective on incredibly fine hair, but it certainly is able to treat the thick and the medium and the medium to fine hair. <clears throat> also, as you're reducing your pulse durations, you're still able to deliver effective fluences. The spot size is fixed in the majority of intense pulse light systems. However, you will find that a number of systems will offer you the option of having two different hand pieces with two different spot sizes. So you can't necessarily alter your spot size on an individual handpiece, but you can have two different handpieces with one regular and one larger spot size available. And again, depending on <clears throat> the, the range of wavelengths that the handpiece, the IPL handpiece is delivering, it is possible to treat up to skin type six safely and effectively. But you generally will find you will have one handpiece that is effective for certain skin type one to four and a separate handpiece because the range of, of wavelengths is slightly different that you're using then to treat your skin type fives and your skin type sixes. So if we look at the, the Norlis and the Sirius, which are two of the systems that we produce, this is our NOLA system, which we can use for hair reduction, but it also has the option to treat a number of other conditions, as you can see here. So we have 21 FDA indications. So not only can we remove hair, so we can provide permanent hair reduction, we can treat vascular lesions, pigmented lesions, scars, inflammatory acne, et cetera, et cetera. So it makes it a very versatile system. From a hair removal point of view, <coughs> excuse me, we have three hand pieces. We have what we call an HR, an HRL, and an HRD. And as the names would suggest, the HRL, the L is standing for large. So this has a larger treatment area. 
and the HRD is when we're treating darker skin. And you can see that we're changing. So we have the HR system is 600 and the HRD is 645. And what that in essence means is that we're starting the initial cutoff filter for the HR handpiece at 600 nanometers and the HRD, we start that cutoff at 645. So we're getting on the lighter skin, we get that absorption happening more superficially. And for the darker skin clients, the skin type fives and sixes, that absorption is happening, happening slightly deeper in the tissue. So we aren't getting the same level of absorption in the epidermis with the HRD as we have with the HR. The other important difference with the IPL handpieces on either the Norlis or the Sirius is we have a second cutoff filter. So in effect, if you look at a typical IPL system, it will have a cutoff filter very similar. It could be 600, could be 645. But then it will deliver wavelengths of light right up to approximately 1200 nanometers. And if you remember from earlier in the presentation, once we get into that 11, 1200 nanometer range, this is where water starts to become a creme fluid. So if you're using a system that goes from 600 to 1200 nanometers, yes, you're, you're getting the energy absorbed into your hair, so you're heating the hair up, but you're also significantly heating up the surrounding tissues and specifically the water within the cells. So therefore you need to have a very effective and efficient contact cooling system on these hand pieces so you're not damaging the surrounding tissues. However, with our dual filter system, our second cutoff filter, specifically when we're looking at our hair removal hand pieces, is at 950 nanometers. So we're cutting off the wavelength just before we get into that area where we're heating up the water or targeting the water. So this means our target heats up, but we don't get the same level of heat in surrounding tissue to such an extent that we don't actually need to use any cooling with this handpiece. And it's still comfortable and an effective treatment. For the patient or the client. These are the three hand pieces and as you can see I've greyed out the other ones but there are other various hand pieces available to treat different things like vascular lesions, pigmented lesions, leg veins, uh, actinic keratosis etc. And if you look at the image on the bottom left hand corner you'll see the difference in the treatment area we can deliver our energy to between the HR600 and the HRL600. So we have double the size on the HRL, so it means that the treatment obviously is quicker when you're treating large areas. So when do you use which handpiece? The HR600 is certainly safe up to skin type 4. I personally would prefer to switch to the HRD handpiece when I'm treating skin type 5, and definitely skin type 6 has to be using the HRD handpiece. The treatment technique first of all, you need to apply a layer of ultrasound gel onto the area you're going to treat. And when we actually place the handpiece onto the skin, we apply a little bit of pressure. And this does two things. First of all, it'll flatten out that hair follicle a little bit. So it means that the, uh, the base of that hair is nearer, is more superficial, it's closer to the surface, which ensures that our light gets deep enough to destroy the structures and disrupt that blood supply. And secondly, by applying that little bit of pressure onto the skin, it then produces the gate theory. And the gate theory basically is saying 
with a nerve ending. A nerve ending can either transmit the sensation of pain or the sensation of pressure. So if we apply some pressure to the area, you will have less transmission of that sensation of pain going to the brain. And I guess the easiest way to think about this in practical terms is if you if you catch your finger in a door or something, the first thing we tend to do is we squeeze the whatever area we've hurt and the pain subsides when we're applying that pain. And that's the data here. Here we have a couple of before and after pictures. So you can see this is after five treatments. And here we're after four treatments and five treatments on a man's back. So very good, effective treatments. And as I said before, as we going through that treatment regime and the, and the hairs are becoming thinner, we have the ability with this system to reduce the pulse durations. The next wavelength we, we're looking at is the Alexandrite, which is 755 nanometers. And I specifically put here 755 nanometer laser and not 755 diode. It is possible to, to find on the market 755 diodes. The wavelength is good, the absorption into the melanin is good, but you have the same issue with a 755 diode that you do with an 810 diode, and the fact that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to reduce your pulse duration sufficiently to get really good clearance on very fine hair. So our 755 laser gives good absorption into the melanin. We can deliver very short pulses. It's effective on all skin thickness, sorry, hair thicknesses, because we can alter our pulse durations. And we're still delivering effective fluences even when we've reduced our pulse duration. We have multiple spot sizes available, and we now have up to a 26 millimeter spot available for hair removal, which obviously means a much bigger area with each pulse, so we can significantly reduce treatment times specifically when we're treating very large areas. With the Alexandrite, we tend to treat up to skin type three, and we can treat skin type four, but with some care. The next option is the NDAG 1064 nanometer, and again, not specifically the diode version of this. Now with an NDAG, we actually have less absorption into the melanin that we do with the 755 nanometer. And the reason that we, we use this handpiece is because we're specifically targeting skin type four and even more so skin type five and skin type six patients. And because we have a less efficient absorption into the melanin, we don't get that same level of absorption into the melanin sitting within the epidermis. The energy will go deeper in the tissue because it's a longer wavelength, but we're almost bypassing that epidermal pigment, which means that we're significantly reducing the risk of complications for skin type five and skin type six. We can still deliver very short pulses if required, effective on all thicknesses of hair, and again, as we reduce our pulse durations, we still have effective fluences available on the system. And we can also use this new 26 millimeter spot size with our NDA. So it means with both of these uh, lasers, we can treat all skin types and we can go up to the biggest spot of 26 and treat an area very, very quickly. So the system that has both of the hand pieces is what we call our Gentle Max Pro. It has an Alexandrite 755 and also an NDAG at 1064. So obviously today we're specifically talking about laser hair reduction, 
So we're using our Alex on the lighter skins and the MDAG on the darker skins. But you also have the ability with this system to treat numerous other conditions, including benign pigmented lesions. If you're going to use your Alexandrite to treat vascular lesions, they need to be no more than a skin type 3. However, with our NDAG, you can treat all skin types for vascular lesions. We can also offer facial treatments, so rejuvenation. We can treat diffuse redness, and we can also treat toenail fungus using our NDAG. So multiple different treatment options using this, this platform. The wavelength selection, obviously, it's dependent on whatever the target is, the patient's skin type. And as I mentioned just now, generally what we will say is if you have a Gentle Max Pro, so you have both of the wavelengths, the optimum way to use it is skin type one to three, you use your Alexandrite. And then when you move to skin type four, fives and sixes, you switch over to the NDA. Very simple to switch from one wavelength to the other. You literally press the button on the touch screen for about two or three seconds, and it will switch over from Alex to NDAG or from NDAG to Alex. And the reason, as I mentioned before, that we like to use the YAG for the darker skin is because of that melanin absorption not being so good which allows us to go deeper into the tissue and also, in effect, bypass that melanin sitting within the epidermis. So we get an efficient and effective treatment, but almost more importantly, a very safe treatment. <clears throat> and we've explained, or I've explained about the, the various um, pulse durations that we have available on the system. So particularly when we're treating lighter skin, we generally will use somewhere between three and 10 milliseconds. When treating darker skin, we may move from 10 to 20 milliseconds. But we do, or we're about to introduce a new system into the market in the next couple of months, where we're actually gonna be moving down to a two millisecond. So this is going to be even more effective on the ultra fine hair that you will sometimes encounter. And it means you should be able to get even better clearance by moving down to that even shorter pulse. Safety point of view, that we have two different options of cooling on our Gentle Max Pro system. On the left hand side, you will see our cryogen or dynamic cooling device, our DCD device. So with this handpiece, what it's doing is it's spraying a predetermined volume of cryogen onto the surface of the skin. It then will wait maybe 20 or 30 milliseconds to allow that cryogen to evaporate. And that evaporation is what's actually cooling the tissue and then the laser will automatically fire after that delay. So it means it's, it's a very efficient, very effective way of cooling the skin. The other option is to use air cooling. And as you can see, the handpiece is a slightly different design <clears throat> because obviously when we're doing air cooling, we need to attach the hose from the cold air chiller to the handpiece to know that we are actually then directing that, that cold air into exactly the right place where the laser is firing. If you do have um, an air cooling device or you're looking at an air cooling device, never try and operate the system without attaching that air cooling handpiece onto the bottom of the laser handpiece. Otherwise, if you're trying to hold them in separate hands, you can't be you can't ensure that you're actually cooling the correct area before you fire your laser. It's specifically designed to um, blow that cold air into exactly the right place where you're firing the laser. <laughs> Treatment technique using the Alex and the NDAG on the GMAX. 
because we're using circular spots, you need an overlap of between 20 and 30 percent. And remember, when you come to do your second line, you need that overlap to be both horizontal and vertical, remembering the line you've just treated. You keep the distance gauge in contact with the skin, hold it at 90 degrees, and as I said, you overlap by between 20 and 30 percent. It's very important, firstly, that that distance gauge is just touching the skin, and secondly, you hold it at 90 degrees. If you don't hold the distance gauge flush with the skin, if you hold it one or two centimeters above, what you in effect do is you defocus that beam and then you're not delivering the same level of energy into the tissue and you won't get an effective result. And the reason that we insist that you hold that handpiece at 90 degrees, at 90 degrees you have a perfect circle. If you change that angle, you then lose your circle and you end up with more of an elliptical shape. And this again means that you're not delivering the total amount of energy into the correct area. This is how we treat. My video is going to work. Here we are. <coughs> so you can see holding the half piece at 90 degrees. So you can see, because we have the ability to, to fire the system at two hertz, so two pulses per second, and particularly in those images, we were using an 18 millimeter spot size, but you can imagine if we've moved up to the 24 or even the 26 millimeter spot size, we cover an area incredibly quickly. We can treat a whole, whole man's back with the 24 or the 26 millimeter spot in less than 15 minutes. So in very, very fast treatment. This is the uh, typical endpoint that you're looking for, which is this perifollicular erythema and edema. So you'll see a little bit of redness and a little bit of swelling around each one of those individual hair follicles. One thing to remember here is if you're treating lighter hair or finer hair, you will still see a skin response, but you don't see the same level of response as you do with thicker, darker hair. And also, if you're using your ND YAG as opposed to the Alexandrite, you don't get the same level of skin response. You still see a skin response, but it's not as strong as you see with the Alexandrite because obviously we don't have quite the same level of absorption into that melanin with the 1064 that we do with the 750. And just a couple of before and after pictures. This, I think this is um, a picture that's worth just mentioning. So here we have certainly a skin type five or potentially a skin type six patient. He has some pseudo folliculite barbie. He's got ingrowing hairs basically in his beard area. This is an incredibly uncomfortable condition to get. And the issue you have, you get that hair in growing, it causes some inflammation, you get some swelling, you get some erythema. Then he shaves it, maybe shaves a little bit of the surface off that um, raised area, which then causes more inflammation and it becomes very sore and very uncomfortable and in essence there's only two ways that you really can get rid of pseudo folliculitis barbie one of them being to grow a beard so then you don't have those short hairs that have that ability to grow back in on themselves or secondly to have laser hair removal 
And you can see here, very, very nice results we've got. And if you look closely at the image on the left-hand side, pre-treatment, you will actually see there is already some post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation caused by that pseudofolliculitis barbi. So that PIH you can see on the right-hand side, sorry, on the left-hand side, was there before the treatment started. The last thing I quickly wanted to go through with you was something that's called paradoxical hypertrichosis. Or some people will simply call it paradoxical hair growth. It's, it's something that is, it's not very common, but it's something that I would expect over the course of a number of years within a clinic when you're doing hair removal, you will probably see one or two examples of this. It can be a congenital issue or it can be acquired. So from the acquired size, side it can be caused by medications so things like steroids can stimulate hair growth penicillin can in some cases thyroid as i mentioned earlier on in the presentation we have seen it in a number of cases in surgical scars or other trauma to the skin tattoos again i think it's because of the trauma um, herpes virus organic agents things like porphyrins can cause it and also exposure to the sun can increase the hair growth. So it's defined as a definite increase in the hair density, color or the coarseness, or a combination of these, in a site when compared with the baseline clinical photographs in the absence of any other known cause of this hypertrichosis. And other people will actually call it um, Terminal hair growth is another term you'll hear used for it. So this is what it looks like. So here we have a 13-year-old girl that's been treated. She's had three IPL sessions of hair removal. And you can see she's now getting hair growth um, beside the area that she's had treated. This is a very common um, presentation of this issue and similarly here you can see this is after seven treatments and we now have thicker coarser darker hair in the area that the treatment was done similarly here you can see this is after 12 sessions it's it's very, very difficult to give an exact number of incidents of this actually occurring. One of the main reasons is if a clinic has, has a case of uh, paradoxical hair growth, they won't necessarily report it to the manufacturer or to any other th authority. So in many cases, this may be happening but we don't have the statistics to show how many cases are actually occurring. It generally, you see it much more in, not so much in the skin type three, but you see it in skin type four, definitely see it in skin type five. The majority of the cases are females. Now that could be purely because the percentage of females having laser hair removal is much higher than the percentage of men. And you see it particularly on the side of the face, you see it on the neck, and particularly on the upper back on the shoulders. It's they're, they're the commonest places you actually see this. <clears throat> because it's it's a, I suppose an underreported condition, it's very difficult to come up with a definitive reason why this is happening. So some of this is theoretical, but the thought is that what's happening is if you're delivering sub-therapeutic levels of energy, so you're not getting your to your clinical endpoint because you're not putting enough heat into those follicles, you may actually end up stimulating rather than disrupting that structure. And we know that heat shock can stimulate the follicular growth 
and also to increase the number of followers. <clears throat> and added to that, you will get some uh, increase in growth factors from inflammation. And the final theory is that what lasers can actually do as you go through the first two or three sessions of, of your hair reduction, they can actually synchronize that allergen phase of the growth cycle. So in essence, what this means is that you may well find that that individual has a higher percentage of allergen hair in the area you're treating. And in some ways, this is actually not a bad thing because if you do, if you have increased the amount of antigen hair in an area, you know that when you do the next treatment, you're actually going to be effective on a bigger percentage of the hair. So that element will actually reduce and you will see that hair reduction carry on and improve. The one thing you do hear a lot of people say is it happens only with an IPL or it happens only with a diode. It's not true. It can happen with an IPL system, certainly happen with ruby lasers, alexandrites, diodes. We don't see or we don't have as many reports of it happening with ND YAGs, but this could be because you don't see as many ND YAG laser hair reduction treatments as you do Alexandra or diode. But it isn't, <coughs> excuse me, it's definitely not wavelength dependent. So, how do you try to prevent it? One of the simplest ways is if you apply a cold pack or cool the area adjacent to the area you're treating. What this will do is this will reduce the risk of actually getting any of that heat being transferred into the surrounding tissues and then stimulating the blood supply and then potentially stimulating the air growth. And secondly, ensure that you're using the correct fluids and the correct pulse duration in order to see that clinical endpoint that you're looking at. So here we have, this is quite an old picture, but you can see what they're doing here is they're using a cold pack under the chin. So adjacent to the area they're treating to stop getting that, potentially getting that thermal spread of heat from the treated area to the area that you don't want to stimulate any new hair growth. So I think really moving forward through this one of the the things we really need to do is is consider doing some kind of a, a big study but the issue is that because it, it, i think it is so underreported it's very difficult to know how many cases so therefore how many clinics we would have to involve in order to do the treatment to get sufficient patients to make it a statistically um, relevant study so finally, in summary, I know I've gone over a few minutes. As I mentioned right at the beginning, hair removal is still the number one requested energy-based treatment. So the market is still there and we know from various different market research studies that have been done that the sector is continuing to grow year on year. Maybe last year we didn't have the same level of growth, but certainly the predictions are that now that, that more clinics are opening and more treatments are being able to be performed again, that we will start to see that growth come back. And it's, again, depending on which one of these market research studies you look at, it's on average that they are predicting about a 20% increase year on year in the number of treatments performed. So there is a big market still there and that market is growing. It's nowhere near got to a stage where it's saturated. So thinking again about that ideal system for hair removal, you need something that gives you that ability to adjust your pulse duration. So you can treat thin hair with very short pulses and thicker hair with longer pulses, 
Also being able to treat all skin types, which is vitally important in your clinic in order to, to make sure that you're not in a position of having to turn away some clients. The ability to have different spot sizes, so you can treat smaller areas with a small spot and then move to a bigger spot size for large areas and then treat them much more quickly. And making sure that you not only can you change your pulse duration, but when you do change your pulse duration and make it shorter, the fluence you're able to deliver is still giving you an effective treatment. <clears throat> so finally, if we look at the Gentle Max Pro with the 755 and the 1064 and the Norlis or the Sirius system, these all give, because of the wavelengths they're delivering, very good melanin absorption. We can change the pulse duration so we can have longer or shorter pulses, which means that all of these systems are effective on all thicknesses of hair. We know we can be effective in the fluence even that when we're shortening our pulse durations. And specifically with our Gentle Max Pro, we now have up to a 20, or we will have up to a 26 millimeter spot size, which means we can treat areas incredibly quickly. And as I mentioned before, we can treat a band back in under 15 minutes. And specifically with the Norlis and the Sirius systems, we have the ability to treat all skin types by using either the HR or the HRD handpiece. And also we have a double size on the HRL for treating areas more quickly. And because of these, the two wavelengths that we have in our gentle series and the two different hand pieces on the Norlis and the Sirius, we can treat all skin types effectively. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, and I'm now going to check and see if we have any questions. Diane, can you see the questions by any chance? Yeah, I can. Would you like me to read some for you? Please, yeah. There's quite a number. Um, if we have a case of blonde hair with skin type 4, what would the best solution be to treat 755 or 1064? And what parameters would be used? Mm. Blonde hair is very difficult to treat. It will depend on how much pigment there is in that blonde hair. Um, and generally what I tend to suggest to clinics is if they do have a patient or a client who has very blonde hair, if they, they can, we know that we're not going to get as an efficient result as we would with, with hair with more pigment in it. However, in some cases, we will see improvement, or you will also sometimes see that the, the regrowth of hair is slowed down dramatically. So in these situations, quite often what you will do is give your, your patient or your client the option to maybe have two treatments and see if they're seeing an improvement. And if they're not, you've already had that conversation, so they know that they, they haven't got the optimum color of hair for treatments. Okay, and what are the indications that would stop you treating with laser hair removal? In specific, I'm not sure specifically what that question is looking at. I've read it as it's written. I, I think maybe they mean... Um, uh, From a contraindication point of view, if that's, if that's the where the question is kind of leading, we don't treat anybody who is pregnant. We don't treat um, breastfeeding mothers. We don't treat it. So basically what we're looking for is a medically fit um, individual that, we, that we're treating. The contraindications are the same for all lasers. If there are um, any breaks in the skin, we don't treat those. We don't treat areas of eczema. Um, I would be very wary about treating somebody that has a history of keloid scars. Diabetic patients, again, be very careful treating diabetics. And I don't, I certainly don't tend to treat a diabetic um, individual anywhere below the knee because of the concerns about peripheral circulation. 
and I would only treat a diabetic if they were very stable in their diabetes. Um, what else on there? Epilepsy. There are obviously two types of epilepsy. One which is um, triggered by light and the other is not triggered by light. But I would still, if, you're, if your patient or your client comes into the clinic and they say they have epilepsy but it's not triggered by light, I would ask for a letter from the doctor just so you've got confirmation that it is definitely not light induced. And what is the best spot size per area? <laughs> that depends on the it depends on the area you're treating. So and it also depends on the specification of the system you have. So the in effect the um the regular GMAX Pro has a maximum spot size of 18. I, I use the 18 on virtually the whole of the body, except probably the top lip. When I make, depending again on, on the size of the top lip, I will probably move down to a 12 millimeter to treat the top lip. But if the area is big enough, I would use the biggest spot size you have, because it means that you're treating more quickly and as we get up to the up to about an 18 millimeter spot size you're then at your maximum depth of penetration so you know that even if you if you go to a 20 or 22 or 24 you're covering the area more quickly but you're not actually going any deeper in the tissue and then lastly um how do you assess how deep a hair is Basically, the deepest hairs you will find are on the back. And we know from all of the studies we've done that even hairs on the back, both the Alexandra and the NDAG are going deep enough into the tissue to treat them. So when using 12, 15 or 18 millimeter with either of the two wavelengths on the Gentle Pro series, we know we're going deep enough in the tissue to get to the, the root, the bulb of that hair follicle and destroy that blood supply. Okay, so there's a couple more, but I think they're more pertinent to the individual clinic, so we'll answer those directly. Lovely, okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, everybody. And Thank um, you, Hamish. I'll be back again, I think, in two weeks for my next one. Thank you. This is the end of the webinar. Thank you for attending.